am ecstatic to be with you all right now. But what I want you to do is stand up really quickly. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your right hand and I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody that you don't know. <laughs> and now I want you to take your left hand and put it on the shoulder of somebody else that you don't know. And, and I want you to quickly introduce yourself. And when you're ready, just have a seat. Yeah. So when I think about the next web, for me, it's, I just think about this web, the connections that are going to happen here, and the energy that's in the room. So quick introduction to myself. My name is Zach Lieberman. I'm an artist. I do really three things. I do art, commercial work, and, um, and education. And so I used to look like this. I studied fine arts, painting, and printmaking, and it's actually accidental that I wound up using computers and technology. And I do a lot of media art projects. So I'm kind of buzz through these kind of quickly. This is a project called the iWriter that I worked on with a group of friends, and we helped develop a tool for a paralyzed graffiti writer named Tempt. And Tempt is an old school graffiti writer. We built an open source, open hardware tool to allow him to draw graffiti with his eye movement. He has a disease called ALS. He's completely paralyzed, and we built a tool that allowed him to draw graffiti with his eyes. This is a project that we did with Toyota. Toyota has this small car called the iQ. People think that you can't drive it quickly, so we designed a typeface, and we hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet. So we made a font completely out of driving. I do outdoor projects. This is a projection in New Zealand. And most building projections, you see the building fall apart and kind of come back together using 3D. We really wanted to do something with the body. So we built an installation where people come, use, they use their body, and then they see themselves as characters like five stories high. I've been doing media art for a long time, for about 15 years. And I taught at Parsons for 10 years. And five years ago, some friends and I decided to start our own school. We started this school called the School for Poetic Computation. And um, we were really interested in poetry. Most people, when they talk about the work that we do, they, they use the word creative coding. We really want to celebrate poetry. What does it mean to be a poet? And in the technology world, there's this concept of demo, like demo or die. But demo, very easily, you flip the letters demo, it very easily becomes the word poem. We want to celebrate poems and poetry. Poetry is amazing. When you go to the bookstore, it's always in the back of the bookstore. You have to go all the way to the back to find the poetry section. And nobody's getting rich writing poems, but it's this very beautiful art form. We wanted to create a school that would celebrate that. And we have this school. We're based in the West Village in New York. And when you come there, you learn electronics, code, and theory. And you really learn it from the ground up, learning like what, does it mean? what is computation, and how can we use it in an expressive and creative way. And there's a lot of hanging out. There's a lot of building. There's a lot of cooking, eating. It's a very lovely space. And I teach this class there called Recreating the Past. And in this class, every week, we study a different artist. So for example, Muriel Cooper, who helped create the MIT Media Lab and had a group there called the Visual Language Workshop. We study her work. Her work is quite beautiful, the, the, this early experiments with typography and 3D. We study her work, and then the students have to recreate her work using modern tools. Or for example, the artist Vera Molnar. She's a Hungarian artist. She's based in Paris now. She would use a write code to control a pen plotter. So the students would study her work and then recreate her work using modern tools. And I love having students sort of engaging with the past and trying to take the past as a starting point and use it for creating new things. We show the work of the students. We were invited to show this at a festival called Day for Night, and we sent them this proposal. We really wanted to show the code and the visual side by side. Usually, when you see an artwork, you don't see the code behind it. If you're on the web, you can do view source. But usually, you just see the, the visual, the output. We wanted to show the code and the visual side by side. So we designed this installation where we're really showing on the left side the text and the right side the visuals. And when some number or some line in the code changes, you can see a corresponding change in the visuals. I told the students that they should wear sunglasses. They didn't believe me, but it was like, we use these LED screens like this, but like super bright. 
um, kind of looked like, like this. Um, but this was showing the work of the students. And then we, this is the work that the students did recreating these artists' work. We also made a zine where you could go home and learn about these artists that we were studying. As the number changes, you see a corresponding change in the visuals. People actually thought we were typing. That would have been very impressive if we could do, be doing that live. But I was watching my students and seeing they were so excited about sketching. They made maybe 50 or 60 sketches. That I got that I got excitement from them. I got enthusiastic about sketching, and I'll, I'm going to talk about sketching and how that relates to my work. I'm going to walk you through one project and then talk about this process of doing daily sketches with code. So I had a student in the school, Yuki Yoshida, and his final project. What he did is there's there's many different algorithms that you can write to tell the computer to draw a circle, and he just made a booklet where on on one side he showed the code, and on the other side he showed the visuals that the code creates. And I thought of a technique for drawing a circle, and I sent him an email, and then I wrote some code to show him. The way this works is quite simple. You start with a, a rectangle, and you pick a random point on one of the four sides, and a random point on one of the three other sides, and you look at that line. And if that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. But if it doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. So it's a way of drawing by absence. If you draw a lot of these lines, you approximate a circle. And I got so excited about this sketch, I started to iterate on it. I, I tried to use words. I tried the word love. That didn't work very well. I tried a smiley face. But then I was thinking, what if those, those lines actually bounced? If they could bounce in the letter, then maybe letters would be more legible. So I started to experiment with, with reflection. What does it look like when light is reflecting off of typography? And I got so excited about light and just making these sketches about seeing how light would bounce off of type. Could life re reflect or refract? I made an installation where I invited people to come and try this. And the way this works, there's the light table. And you can put down acrylic shapes. And, and this software simulates how light would bounce off of those shapes. these kinds of projects is that they're really physical. They start with your body, but they go from your body to your mind and then back to your body. By the end, people aren't even using the letters. They're just putting their hands down or putting their face down. And there's something really, I find really beautiful to watch this sort of body, mind, body process. So I got inspired by the students. I started this process of doing daily sketches. And basically, every day on Instagram, I, I write software. I post these tiny poems that I make with code, tiny animations, these daily sketches with code. I want to talk a little bit about the, the influences, obviously inspired by the school. And at the school, we have this thing that we post on the wall. These are um, 10 rules for students. These are popularized by John Cage, but they're really written by sister Corita Kent. These are amazing rules. And I love rule seven, the only rule is work. Um, if you work, it will lead to something. 
I love this kid. This kid, I saw this kid on the subway, and he had a phone, a camera, and also snap spectacles. So I love this picture. There's so many cameras at this moment, and I have my phone out taking a picture of him. But I think artists need to be like this. We need to be documenting and capturing everything we do. So I have this folder on my computer. It's called Every Day, and every screenshot, every video, all the things that I make go in there. And the folder is about 300 gigabytes. It's pretty crazy.、Um, the other thing that I have is this thing which I call ABI. It's inspired by this film. A B C. A always B B C closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. But for me, it's not A A B C. It's A B I. Always be iterating. I think when most people think about creativity, you think like I'm going to start with a blank canvas, a blank piece of paper, and I'm going to make something new every day. But actually, what I try to do is start with what I've done and change it and iterate and just it, focus on iteration. And I think this image really explains it. This kid had to write, "I will make better choices" over and over again. And you can see by the end, they've optimized it. Right? They're just drawing a single line for the L. It's so that's fucking amazing.、They're, they have optimized it, and this is the truth. If you have to do something over and over again, you have to develop shortcuts. And as an artist, those shortcuts become your style. So I started to do these sketches. They started with reflection, just sort of seeing how how I could simulate light, just seeing where is the light coming from, where are the walls. I would show this to my daughter. She was six at the time, and every morning she's like, "Oh, that's cool! I'm amazed! I'm hypnotized!" And then at some point she was like, "You have to change." She has, she's like my art director now, so she's telling me what to do. So I woke up. I said, "Okay, I'm going to change." I started to make blobs, just these blob shapes. How I was like, "What? What are these blob shapes look like? How are they moving?" And sometimes you do a sketch like this one. I did really quickly, and people liked this way more than I did. For me, it was like something I tossed out. Like I just did it really fast, and I think that's beautiful to figure out what people like more than you, or things that you like more than people like. And to me, those are data points. Those are really interesting data points to figure out how you are in harmony or disharmony with the world. I did this. My daughter hated it. I loved it. Sometimes I get inspired by different designers. Like Lance Wyman has this beautiful、um, design identity for the Mexico '68 Olympics, and I, I love these curves. So I said, okay, how could I use these curves? Could I create blobs that have these curves as offsets? And that led to like all different types of experiments. I do a lot of like how blobs would interact with blobs. For me, this I'd like to show this one because it it suggests what I'm interested in, which is 3D graphics that look like 2D or 2D graphics that look like 3D. I think they they ask your brain to work a little harder, like an optical illusion. Oftentimes, my sketches are like diary entries. So after the election I, and before the new year, I had this weird feeling of being sort of happy about the new year and really sad about the results of the election. And so this diary was my way of ex expressing this kind of weird confusion that I had at that moment. Or after the inauguration, Trump's inauguration. It felt like we were protesting every weekend. Like my wife and I were at JFK and like Women's March, and I I just felt like, what does it feel like to be in a crowd pushing? And the sketches are reflecting that feeling. Or on the anniversary of my father's passing away, I was like, what what am I going to do? I found this walking data, just a motion capture of a single person walking, and to me that data reflected my mood and how alone I felt, and started to experiment and iterate on that. A lot of times they're just random. Like I found this video clip of me drawing a line with ink, and I said, "How could I connect that and make something with it?" Or really graphical, just taking arcs and connecting them to make new forms.、Um, just like kind of taking simple geometry. Like this one is just taking half circles and lines and connecting them and seeing what happens when you extrude them and create a kind of infinite line based on half circles and straight lines. Sometimes they're inspired by different artists. So, for example, I went to the MoMA and I saw these sculptures by Ruth Asawa. These beautiful sculptures with wire that are like circles in space, kind of expanding and contracting. And then I would make a sketch that's not—I'm not trying to recreate her work, but really trying to take some feeling that I got from the work and bring it to my own work. Like what happens when you have circles expanding and contracting into space? I do a lot of stuff with the body. So, taking the body as the starting point and. And trying to extend, extrude the body, see what happens. 
if you take the body and revolve it, if you attach stuff to the body. Um, a lot of times just thinking like, where is, what are the thresholds of legibility? Um, and this is an installation I did with Margaret Atwood, the author, where we took text from her novel and we wrapped it around your body so you could actually perform it with your body. This was at the South Bank Center. And we took three different seeds, scenes from her novel, Hack Seed, and we brought them to life in a kind of interactive way. So actually taking the words from the book and wrapping it onto your body. Um, and she was amazing at it, actually. Here she is. She's awesome. Um, she was probably like the best at using it. And she told me that if Shakespeare was alive, that he'd be using a connect. So I was quite excited about that. <laughs> Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of experiments with augmented reality, and you know, there's, it's, we've been doing this for a long time. I remember doing AR stuff in 2002, but recently with these AR Kit and AR Core, there have been all kinds of experiments seeing like, what, it, what could we do, how could we put objects in space? But I'm really interested in what does it mean that we have a camera where we know where the camera is in space? So this is an experiment where you take photographs and the photographs stay where you took them. So as you take a photograph, the photograph stays in the lo location that you took it. This is painting with pixels. So taking the pixels that are in front of you and then dragging them out in 3D so that you're kind of using the world as a paintbrush, the colors of the world in front of you as a kind of 3D paintbrush. This is taking photographs and uh, breaking them into pieces and exploding them in 3D. So there's one vantage point where the image looks correct, but as you move, the image starts to break. And I think AR is an interesting medium for ambiguity, for creating images that are just really weird and strange and kind of messed up, fucked up. This is taking photographs, and as you move, the photograph is correct from one vantage point, but it's warped as you start to move. This is taking frames of video and leaving the frames of video in 3D space where you took them so that you can actually then walk through it and replay the video. As you physically walk through where you took the video, you can replay the video. This is recording audio in space. And when you move through it, it replays. This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. Good afternoon, girl, you know what's nice in the Off the set, is it? This is a test of talking and what happens when we record audio in space. Space, space. space. audio in space. Um, and we've been taking some of the stuff that we've been doing in the studio around AR and making apps, and we just made our first app. It's called Weird Type. And this allows you to, to write messages, and then you can actually draw the messages in space. So it's a way of kind of working with typography, but allowing you to actually put type in space. And the, the thing that I love about making apps is that it's actually people are way more creative than we are. So we had some ideas about how to use this, but actually, like, people have been doing crazy stuff with it, like doing, taking typography and almost drawing with it, like using type as particles and drawing things in 3D that I can never imagine, or taking the letter O and drawing a tunnel, like dragging the letter O and making a tunnel and then running through the tunnel. I love making tools and then seeing all this stuff that people do with it and how it kind of winds up in the world. So that's a weird type. And then the last thing I want to say, so I started two and a half years ago, I started this process of doing daily sketching, where every day I post sketches. At the same time, I started doing this thing called open office hours, where on Twitter, I, once a week, I make myself available for two to three hours for anybody. And I do this on Skype or Hangout or in person in Brooklyn. And I have d been doing this for two and a half years. And I find this really amazing, that if, if daily sketching is, is a, a way of saying hello to the world, open office hours is a way of listening to the world. And these two things have had a really big, like really profound impact um, in the way I've been working in the last two and a half years. Um, the last thing I want to say is thanks. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I hope you have a great rest of the conference.